Alrighty, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. Uh, my co-host today is Cindy Warwick, um, who is in charge of our Author Talk series, um, which this is a part of. And our speaker today is Joe Farkas. Uh, Cindy will be doing a little bit more of a deep dive into uh, Joel's introduction. Um, I'm just here to kind of go over some of the, the housekeeping items and serve as tech support. Um, the first and foremost, uh, we will be taking your questions at the end of Joel's presentation today. Um, and you can submit them using the Q&A feature or the chat feature um, in the dashboard. So um, if anybody is unfamiliar with Zoom or the dashboard, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using it on a laptop or a desktop. Um, if you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all of the settings and features will still be there. Um, there is an audio settings down here, so if you lose audio or having trouble with your audio, you can check there to make sure that your audio settings are correct. If you have problems during the webinar, please hit this raise hand button. I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to help with any of the problems that you are having. And as I mentioned regarding the Q&A session, there is a Q&A button as well as a chat button down there. You can click on either one of them. You can send us your, your questions, your comments, um, and we'll be happy to, to address them at the end of Joel's presentation. So that is it for me. I'm gonna turn it over now to Cindy for the introduction. Well, and I'm gonna welcome you as well. Uh, good afternoon, and I, I do hope you are enjoying a good holiday season. And I wanna thank you for uh, helping us to celebrate Patriots Week uh, in this Trenton and Princeton area, and for being with us at this uh, State Library talk. I do wanna give us give you some ideas that looking ahead into January, we have some great webinars coming up. Uh, on January 14th, I apologize if I do not say this gentleman's name right, but I'm just gonna say it like I know what it is. Alan Delosier, he's the Executive Director of the New Jersey Catholic Historical Commission. He's gonna explore archival resources and the New Jersey Catholic experience. And that's on the 14th from noon to one. And then on January 19th, we have genealogy from home done by our, our um, genealogical librarian. And that is Regina Fitzpatrick. And, and she always does a good job on her webinars. I hope you can join us for one of those or both. And if for some reason you can't though, we usually record these sessions. So please check out the State Library's YouTube channel. Um, and you know, you can, you can, visit them or revisit them if you've taken the class and just want to hear it again. Our next talk after this one is in January and it's on the 11th. It's entitled Hardenberg Hikes Through History. And it's by Paul Soltis. He's the New Jersey State Park Services Resource Interpretive Specialist for the Wallace House and Old Dutch Parsonage Historic Sites in the Somerville area. And he's going to explore the origins of the Hardenberg and Rutgers families in New Jersey and New York. Now, Hardenberg was an artist, Ger Gerard Rutgers Hardenberg. He was an artist and ornithologist about the turn of the 20th century. And you'll learn about the academic tradition of science and the natural philosophy at New Jersey's colonial colleges that informed him and see some of the landscapes preserved at New Jersey state parks and forests today that inspired him. He would do mostly uh, Jersey Shore landscapes and, and birds. He did a lot of the birds. Uh, for today, back to Patriots Week, and, and there's a lot going on, so you can check out that website if you wish. You're going to be introduced to a 21-year-old Virginia militia major named George Washington, and you're going to follow him through a timeline of events, and I'm not going to say any more because Joel will be doing that, but our speaker is author, lecturer, and historian Joel Farkas. He's a graduate of Ohio State University. He served as an officer in the United States Army. Thank you for your service, Joel. He's a lecturer for the Florham Institute for Lifelong Learning at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and he's a volunteer docent for the National Park Service at Washington's headquarters in Morristown, New Jersey. He's a recipient of the National Park Service Centennial Volunteer Challenge Award, and he also likes to collect original historical autographs. So, uh, Joel, we welcome you, and I look forward to what you're going to give to us in today's presentation. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Okay, so thank you for the... Uh, the introduction. So everybody, I'm going to go on what's called screen sharing. So everybody just uh, stay where you are for a moment and we will get on to screen sharing and then the lecture.
Okay. Um, can you, Cindy, can you see me? Can you see what's on the screen? And of course, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, so let us begin. So this lecture I call George Washington, New Jersey and the Revolutionary War. So this is a map of North America circa 1753, where you see Great Britain, the 13 colonies, all the blue is land that France controlled. And between those two is a disputed area that both countries claimed. So the colony of Virginia gets word that the French are building fortifications in that area. And so Virginia sends some of their militia to tell the French to leave. So the first we want to do is we want to define militia. Militia are amateur, key word here, citizen soldiers. They are barely trained, they are poorly equipped, but nonetheless, they are asked to go to Virginia to tell the French to leave and they are led by a 21 year old Virginia major named George Washington. Washington gets to the French, the French disagree, Washington returns to Virginia the following year. Washington goes back, this time he has more men with him. A firefight breaks out, men are killed, and this is the beginning of what we call the French and Indian War. Now it sounds like the French are fighting the Indians. What it is, it's the French and their Indian allies fighting us, the British. Remember back then we are still British. So. Virginia requests and receives an army from England under a general Edward Braddock. And now we have a problem. You see, we've got this British army, highly trained, beautifully equipped, uh, the most successful fighting force in the world at that time. And they have to fight alongside the militia, poorly trained, barely equipped, and so the British regulars have nothing but contempt for the militia, they're dismissive of the militia, and they ridiculed the militia mercilessly. And how did they do that? They do that with a song, which is called Yankee Doodle. So on the count of three, you are all gonna sing Yankee Doodle. One, two, three. Yankee Doodle went to town, riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat, and called macaroni. I hope you can read, you can stop now. <laughs> so when I give this lecture in person, I, I, everyone in the audience knows the song. They certainly know the melody. And most people know some, if not all of the words, which is amazing because some of you probably haven't even thought about this song in, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And I'll bet it came right back to you. But what do the words mean? Ever think about that? So what's a Yankee? And please do not say a baseball player. A Yankee is a derogatory term used by the British against the colonists. A doodle is a just a simpleton. So Yankee doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni? What in the world does pasta have to do with anything? Well, in colonial times, if you were the height of Italian fashion, the epitome of fashion, you were called a macaroni. And that is what that song means. And of course, eventually that it gets turned around and, be, and it becomes a patriotic song. So I want to apologize to everybody right now. Tomorrow morning, 3, 3.30, some of you are going to wake up this song or the melody at least is going to be bouncing around in your heads and you're gonna start cursing me. So I'll just apologize now ahead of time. So the fighting in North America goes to Europe where it lasts for seven more years. And in Europe, it's called the Seven Years War. And in 1763, it's all over. So on your left is the map we started with. Now look on the right, look at all the land that Britain now uh, claims. So of course, France loses. Notice how Eastern Canada goes from French to British. So Britain has a problem though. They're broke, no money in the treasury. They owe money because fighting a war for a total of nine years is on the expensive side. And so Britain decides to tax the colonies, 
uh, and enforce taxes that were actually already on the books, but were never really enforced. And of course, this leads to the cry of no taxation without representation. But what does that really mean? I'm sure you know what the words mean, but under English law, only your elected representatives to parliament could tax you. And since the colonies had no representatives in parliament, they could not be taxed. So that was the argument, which of course, parliament and King George uh, said, forget it. So the, 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 the tax that really infuriated people and they got the protests going, it's called, we call it the Stamp Act. I used to always think it was, a, it was a tax on postage stamps. It's actually a tax on any kind of printed papers. That there had to be a, a stamp affixed to the papers showing that the taxes were paid. Well, this leads to one man who gets the protest going in a really big way. I don't know if any of you recognize this man, but this man is Samuel Adams. The historian Thomas Fleming, without his skill at combining agitation, his meaning Samuel Adams, and propaganda, without his skill at combining agitation and propaganda, there might not have been an American revolution. Samuel Adams was so powerful in the eyes of the British Parliament, et cetera, that was reportedly he was declared the most dangerous man in America. So how do we remember the most dangerous man in America today? Beer. Well, eventually the Stamp Act is repealed, but then it's just replaced with some more taxes. This results in even more protests. And eventually, these taxes are repealed, except for one. Parliament says, we can't keep repealing all of our taxes. It's going to look like we don't have any authority. So they keep one tax on the books. You can probably guess what tax that is, a tax on tea. So tensions mount. Britain sends over troops that occupy Boston. And in 1770, we have what's called the Boston Massacre. By the way, that name, Boston Massacre, that's from Samuel Adams. He specifically used the word massacre because as, and then he spreads the word all over New England. Uh, and so it, it sounds as though the British are, are just killing everybody in sight. And the idea was to inflame the colonists against the British. So five protesters are shot. They're protesting uh, against the British. Uh, the British fire into the protesters. The first one killed, you may recognize this name, Crispus Attucks. Uh, he's the first casualty of what becomes the Revolutionary War uh, and also unfortunately the, the first fatality. Now the image of that is this. This image was originally done by a man named Henry Pelham. He was an engraver and engravers would often come up with an idea, do some printings of it, and sell them, I mean, that's how they made money. So he comes up with this idea and he, eh, he doesn't do anything with it. He kind of puts it aside. Another engraver sees it and says, whoa, I can make some changes and I can make this into a really strong propaganda piece. So this is the second engraver's version of Henry Pelham's engraving. Now, look at your screen on the far left. That's the original Henry Pelham and look at the building. And above the balcony, you see two floors and there's no writing or anything on the wall between the two sets of windows, right? Now look on the right, I'm gonna blow this up. And what does the second engraver add? Butcher's Hall, get it? Butcher, there were this, there's something like 10 or 20 of these very subtle uh, changes that the second engraver made to make this a really powerful propaganda piece. Who was the second engraver? How about Paul Revere? Paul Revere did a lot more than ride a horse, as, as we're going to find out. But let's go back. So we've got five fatalities. The British soldiers go on trial. That, that's, that's the law. And they need legal representation. Who becomes their lawyer? How about Rodney Dangerfield? <laughs> Anybody remember Rodney Dangerfield? Well, Rodney Dangerfield was known for, I don't get no respect. And that is the case of the lawyer who did defend the British soldiers, John Adams. In our world today, uh, we, we really remember more about Abigail because of the miniseries uh, than about John. And John, 
John was not warm and fuzzy and lovable, but he was truly, truly uh, um, influential and important uh, in the founding of our country. At any rate, 1773, we have the Boston Massacre. Uh, I'm sorry, the Boston Tea Party. One of the men in charge of the Boston Tea Party, Samuel Adams. He was one of the heads of the Sons of Liberty, the protest group in Boston. Now, over in England, of course, Parliament and King George III are watching all this. And King George gets really upset about the destruction of British tea. So another set of acts come down, uh, which we call the Intolerable Acts. Britain called them the, the Coercive Acts. And among these acts, Boston Port is closed. And the members of Massachusetts government legislature were going to be appointed now by the king instead of by popular election. And that was, that was really, really upset the colonists. And meanwhile, the rest of the colonies are watching all this. And so in 1774, the colonies meet for the first time in what we call the First Continental Congress. One of the men there, Patrick Henry, said something that was very prescient. The distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and English are no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. See, there were the 13 colonies had very little to do with each other. They might as well have been 13 individual countries that just happened to share common borders. And now the, this concept of the allegiance to the whole as opposed to your part of that whole is something that needs to happen. And so Patrick Henry says this, which I thought was pretty good. So the result of the First Continental Congress is agreed that there's gonna be a boycott on importing British goods and British imports dropped 97%. And we were the mother country's largest trading partner. And so a letter is sent to King George asking him to please repeal the taxes. Let's go back to the way things were. Uh, life was good. Why do we have to, you know, why does this all have to happen? We, let's end it now. Uh, he doesn't even read the letter. And so in 1775, Patrick Henry in a speech says, give me liberty or give me death. This kind of becomes the battle cry, taking the place of no taxation without representation. At the same year, we have the Second Continental Congress. You can see the names of some of the people who came. Uh, George Washington arrives in his military uniform. He might have had some inside knowledge of what was going to happen. Also, ironically, on the same date, we have the Battle of Fort Ticonderoga. So two men, independent of each other, had the same idea to capture, try to capture Fort Ticonderoga in which are military stores, cannons, et cetera, which uh, the Continental Army, which wasn't, we hadn't officially formed yet, but we desperate, desperately needed weapons, munitions of any kind. So one of the two men was actually a furniture store named Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys. And the other was, sitting down, Benedict Arnold. Yes, that Benedict Arnold. Before he became a traitor, Benedict Arnold was Washington's best general. He was the only general, the only officer really doing anything. And one of the one of the things, one of the issues that happened some years later, you know, if you if you go through New Jersey and actually many, many places, you see all of these historic markers which tell about something that happened at a at a, at a specific place. So a marker is going to be done for the capture of Fort Ticonderoga. And the question becomes, do you mention Benedict Arnold? Now remember, this is what could be 150 years after the event. So here's a marker. And the answer is no, you do not mention Benedict Arnold. They, they mention Ethan Allen. They do not mention Benedict Arnold. What's this an image of? I'm sure most of you recognize it. It's Paul Revere's ride. So we're going to talk about the real ride, not the poem. And there is a difference, and that's for another lecture. The ride starts with this man, Dr. Joseph Warren. He was a medical doctor. He was one of the heads of the Sons of Liberty. 
because the other two, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, there he is again, are in hiding because they're wanted by the British for treason. And Warren happens to have a spy in British headquarters. And the spy tells him that the British have learned that in Concord, the Sons of Liberty, the militia, the, uh, the Minutemen, the colonial forces have munitions, et cetera, hidden. And the British are going to go and capture those munitions or destroy them, whatever that needs to be done. And Warren looks at a map, well, I'm sure he didn't have to, and realizes that to get to Concord, you have to pass Lexington, where Samuel, where, uh, Samuel Adams and John Hancock are hiding. So he calls in his favorite writer, Paul Revere, to go and warn the people in Lexington, warn the people in Concord that the British are coming. They wouldn't have been called the British because everybody would tell you it was British, the, uh, uh, the regulars or, or the Redcoats. And of course, the poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. But, Joseph Warren says, you know, there are British patrols out. What if Paul Revere gets stopped? Who's gonna warn everybody? So he calls in a second man, a man named William Dawes. So in reality, it really should have been the midnight rides of Paul Revere and William Dawes, but William Dawes is not in the poem. Therefore, nobody knows about William Dawes. Well, I feel badly about that. I think because William Dawes did literally the same thing that Paul Revere did, he should be given some credit. So we're gonna honor William Dawes. And I came across this poem, I'm not gonna read you the whole thing. I'm only gonna read you a little bit of it. History rings with his silvery name. Paul Revere was a silversmith. I thought that was kind of clever. Close to me are the portals of fame. Had he been Dawes and I Revere, no one had heard of him, I fear. No one has heard of me because he was Revere and I was Dawes. Well, that's our little tribute to William Dawes. So it was actually a third man, a Dr. Prescott, but uh, Revere and Dawes go on their way. They are successful at Lexington and Concord. However, at the same time there, or shortly thereafter, we have the battles of Lexington and Concord historically or popularly known as a shot heard around the world. And this is considered the beginning of the Revolutionary War. So the British, after these two battles, are go back to Boston. They are harassed by the militia all the way back. Now the British army is basically in Boston proper. Word goes out all over New England about what has happened. Your fellow citizens are being murdered are being slaughtered, are being massacred, thank you, Samuel Adams, up to 15,000 patriots converge and become in what becomes known as the Siege of Boston, which lasts 11 months. This is a map of the area. You see Boston in the middle of this map. Boston is at sea level, which from a military standpoint back then was, a, was bad because you're at, you're at low, the lowest point and higher points would have an advantage over you. So the, and the British army realizes this, the British Navy. So they look around and they say, you know, we got to secure some high ground for our own protection. And maybe from this high ground, we can then break this siege. So this becomes known as the Battle of Bunker Hill. One of the bloodiest battles of the American Revolution on a percentage basis, the British general said, the loss we have sustained is greater than we can bear. General Nathaniel Green, one of Washington's three most trusted advisors, I wish we could sell him another hill at the same price. Now, Bunker Hill really begins in that the Patriot, the colonial forces, the, uh, the militia learn what the British are up to. And so the night before they go down, set up what's called a redoubt, kind of a defensive position, and wait for the British. Meanwhile, Dr. Joseph Warren, who's the, who's the head of the Sons of Liberty at this point, he of course knows what's, what's going on. He's sitting in his office, 
And he realizes he just cannot, can't stay there. He has to be with the men. So he goes to the battle, he fights in the battle, and unfortunately he is killed in that battle. It's a famous painting by John Trumbull. Now, the British soldiers recognize Warren. They show his body no mercy, and eventually he's dumped into a mass grave. About, oh, three, four, five, six months later, his family wants to find his body to give it a proper burial. So they start going through these graves. You can imagine going through graves maybe six months after the people are buried in them. At any rate, they find a body that they think might be Dr. Warren's because in the mouth are two false teeth. And Warren had two false teeth implanted in his mouth. So they go to the dentist who did the work. The dentist comes out and says, yes, that is Joseph Warren. And so Joseph Warren gets the burial that his family wanted for him. Who was the dentist? How about Paul Revere? Yeah, I told you he did a lot more than just uh, ride a horse. You guys remember Groucho Marx, you bet your life. So Groucho used to have this thing. He always wanted everybody to win something. So if you didn't answer a question you know, correctly, down comes this duck. And he, the duck would have a question that was, the answer was pretty obvious. For instance, who's buried in Grant's tomb? So we're gonna do a Groucho Marx moment. And the question is, on what hill did we fight the Battle of Bunker Hill? And if you said Bunker Hill, obviously it's a trick question, you're wrong, because we actually fought, fought the Battle of Bunker Hill on Breed's Hill, if you look at the map. No one is actually sure why. So if you go to the monument for Bunker Hill, uh, you better go to Breed's Hill. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. By the way, in front of the monument, you can see there's a statue of a man. Uh, that is Colonel Prescott, who was the leader of the forces in the field. He is credited with saying, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Now, there's a lot of discussion that uh, any number of people might have said that. But for this, in this particular case, he's credited with having said it. The 14th colony, as in Canada. So Canada is a big British staging area, a lot of British troops up there, etc. And so the idea is that we would attack Canada, Montreal, and Quebec City, and maybe even make them a fourth colony. So it's a two-pronged attack. On the left is a water route, and that is led by a General Montgomery. And on the right is a land route led by Benedict Arnold. You see he's a colonel in his picture, which is, was his rank at that time. Let's go back to this map. Look at on the right, the route Arnold takes. And if you're not familiar with what you're seeing, you're looking at today's state of Maine. Can you imagine about walking, walking, remember walking, no roads through the state of Maine in December to get to Canada? Well, Arnold lost about half of his men to, to weather, et cetera. He eventually makes it. At the battle for Quebec City, General Montgomery unfortunately is killed. Arnold is wounded in the leg. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, colonial forces are not successful in capturing Quebec City, but nonetheless, Arnold eventually gets what's left of his army off uh, or out of Canada. He's actually regarded as a hero for his efforts. He's promoted to Brigadier General. So here's a marker that's now in the state of Maine that mentions Benedict Arnold by name. Let's go to 1776. This man, Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine publishes a pamphlet called Common Sense in which he says, it's time to separate from England. Monarchy is a bad form of government. We need to do it now. He writes this pamphlet in simple, easy to understand words. The logic is there. It becomes the, the America's first bestseller. 
one out of every five families in all 13 colonies had a copy of Common Sense. All the money Thomas Paine made, he gave to Washington's army because he didn't really, didn't really care about money. As John Adams said, without the pen of Paine, the sword of Washington would have been wielded in vain. We're gonna get back to Thomas Paine. In June of 1776, Richard Henry Lee stands up in front of Congress with a resolution, part of which says these United Colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. So a resolution needs to be debated and then voted upon. This is, again, this is an, another famous painting by John Trumbull. So Congress, Congress back then, by the way, was one house. It's not two houses as it is today. And so Congress realizes that if this resolution passes, we, we need something in writing. Remember, there's no television, there's no internet. We need something in writing to immediately get out to the people so they understand what's happened, to get out to the army, to go overseas so other countries can understand what happens, what's happening. So a five-man committee is appointed. And in this picture, you see in the center is Thomas Jefferson, to his left is John Adams. To his right, again, as you're looking at the picture, is Ben Franklin. And two in the back are Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. And so they're tasked with drafting a Declaration of Independence. And this picture is actually Jefferson, who was the main architect of it, presenting the draft to the president of Congress, John Hancock. Well, they have the debate. And it passes. We declare independence. What date? What was the date that we declared independence? Ready for this one? How about July 2nd? Yes, we did not declare independence on July 4th. We declared independence on July 2nd. So the question becomes, so what's with July 4th? Well, this draft that was presented to Congress, to John Hancock in the painting, the wording is debated. On July 4th, that wording is approved. It goes down the street to Dunlap Printers, and he starts working on printing a couple hundred of these are called broadsides. They're not signed. To get these out as quickly as possible, Washington has it read to his army. It goes in all the newspapers. It goes to all the, uh, the colonies. Uh, it, it goes overseas. And then eventually it gets, this is, this is called the engrossed copy, where it's, it's written out by hand and it's signed. So one day my, my 12 year old grandson calls me and he says, grandpa, I got a question for you. Where was the Declaration of Independence signed? Well, I'm thinking to myself, all right, I'm glad he's asking a history question. I said, Philadelphia. He said, grandpa, it's signed at the bottom of the page. So much for 12 year olds. The Battle of Valcourt Island. So Washington gets word that the British are sending down ships from Canada, uh, down the St. Lawrence River, Lake Champlain, to meet up with troops coming west from New York City to try to cut off the, the New England colonies. And Washington turns to Benedict Arnold and says, you got to stop them. And Arnold does. He builds a, a, small, a, a fleet of smaller ships, but he comes up with this strategy, and it takes place at Valcourt Island. And without going into all the details, the end result is the British are delayed and they, it's the, 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 the season is now getting into early, into fall and the British realize if they stay around any longer, they're gonna get frozen in. Remember, this is all wind power that moves these ships. So they go back and the whole plan falls apart thanks to Benedict Arnold. So we're back to the markers. Do you acknowledge his name? Do you not acknowledge his name? Here's a marker where his name is not acknowledged. But then again, here's another marker where his name is acknowledged. Washington's first battle, the Battle of Long Island, which he loses. And this picture that you see on your screen is actually to show percentages after the battle. Look at how few Washington's troops are left versus the British. But Washington gets lucky and he's able to escape. And so the rest of this year, the British are chasing Washington all through New Jersey, which leads us to Trenton. So 
Washington is finally able to get to the Delaware and he crosses over the Delaware, which will give him some protection. And uh, he's going from New Jersey to Pennsylvania, which is the other side of the Delaware. So kind of reverse this image. And when he gets to Pennsylvania, who's there to greet him but the Kingston Trio. So the Kingston Trio had a hit song, some of you may remember this, uh, called the MTA. The opening words of that song are, these are the times that try men's souls. Who wrote those words? Thomas Paine. Washington's army was in dire straits. Many of the men had a one-year contract that was going to expire. If they go home, the war's over. Actually, the war's lost, even worse. So Washington is so taken with what Paine wrote, he had read to his army, that and some other things, and enough men stay that Washington has an army in the field. <laughs> but whatever happened to Thomas Paine? So Thomas Paine becomes an aide to one of the generals during the war. After the war, he goes to France because he's looking for another revolution. And whoa, the French Revolution, perfect. He goes to France where he's greeted as a hero. But then things happen. He runs afoul of Robespierre and it's the reign of terror. And suddenly Thomas Paine is put in jail. And he almost, but not quite, gets guillotined but he manages not to, this is a whole long story. I don't wanna go into it at this point. I, I do it in a different lecture. The end result is eventually Thomas Paine comes back to America. Now at this point, he's a broken man, uh, physically, emotionally. Now at the end of the Revolutionary War, in gratitude, he was given a, a small home in New Rochelle, New York. So he finally comes back to America uh, but he's, he, they say he's a broken man. Uh, he spends a lot of time in Greenwich Village, becomes uh, an alcoholic, and eventually he dies. I read it uh, in one article, a uh, 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 story about Thomas Paine, that he was arguably the third most popular man in America after the war, after George Washington and Ben Franklin. At his funeral, Thomas Paine's funeral, six people attended. Uh, so I think it's safe to say he got forgot, but not quite. See, there was a newspaper, Thomas Paine was born in England. There was a newspaper editor who was in America, he goes back to England, and a few years after, he, after Thomas Paine dies, actually, he decides there should be a memorial to Thomas Paine because of how important Thomas Paine was and all the things he did. So he decides he's going to raise money and build a memorial to Thomas Paine. Now, he's in England, by the way. And so what does he do? In the dead of night, he has Thomas Paine's body dug up and shipped to England. Think about this for a second. Uh, of course, when it was found out, a lot of people were not particularly happy. And meanwhile, over in England, nobody cares about Thomas Paine anymore. And so Thomas Paine's body winds up in a closet somewhere. No one really knows. And eventually his body literally disappears. 2001, the New York Times has this article. You, you can look this up, which basically says, whatever happened to Thomas Paine's body? Well, they got a response from Australia, which said, I bought his head at an auction in London. Send me $60,000 and I'll do a DNA test. I don't think the New York Times sent $60,000 to Australia. However, if you have nothing to do this weekend, uh, hey, listen, maybe you want to go on a little treasure hunt. At any rate, let's go back. The Battle of Trenton. So Washington crosses the Delaware again. He comes back. We have the Battle of Trenton. Washington's first victory as a commander. This is the very end of 1776, 1777. This is a famous painting by Charles Wilson Peale. And if you look under Washington's uh, elbow, you'll see a building, which is Nassau Hall. So the British are eventually driven into Nassau Hall. And Washington and uh, some of his officers are kind of outside uh, having a discussion how to get the British out of there. And like out of nowhere, here comes this young captain of artillery and he has his men uh, dragging a cannon and just on his own, he, right, he, doesn't, he doesn't ask permission. He fires a couple cannonballs in Nassau Hall and the British surrender. 
Well, Washington is very impressed with the ingenuity of this captain and he vows to keep an eye on him. And this captain I'm talking about was Alexander Hamilton. And that began the relationship between Washington and Hamilton. 1777, we have the Saratoga campaign. Two battles, kind of at the same time, well, not quite, but almost. Uh, and these two battles were the, were the turning point of the war, although nobody really realized it at the time. Who was the hero of Saratoga? Benedict Arnold. Yep, without him, there would not have been a victory. In that battle, Arnold is shot in the leg, in the same leg he was shot in when he was up in Canada. So, years later, at the battle site, a monument. Do you mention Arnold's name? Well, if you go there today, you will see a monument, but it's to Arnold's leg. This is called the Boot Monument, and that's how they acknowledge Arnold's, I, I use the word contribution, but it was really Arnold's doing that we were victorious. Now, the importance of this victory is this, we needed help, we knew we needed help. Uh, there was no way we could beat Britain, they would just outlast us. And the obvious one to help us was France. So France was kind of helping us on the side, on the slide, but uh, it wasn't enough. So the King of France wouldn't commit. So Ben Franklin's living there, trying to get him to commit to help us. John Adams goes there and so on and so forth. The King of France kept on saying, I gotta see a sign, something that convinces me that you even have a chance against the British. Look how powerful they are and look how unpowerful you are. Well, this victory was that sign. That's why this, this victory was so important. So who was the King of France? It was Louis XVI. And who was his wife? So who's the one French queen? that we all remember. And those of you who are saying Marie Antoinette, you are correct, of course. And what is she remembered for having said? For those of you who said, let them eat cake, that is what she's remembered for having said, except she never said it. So there, <laughs> this is just one of those myths or legends that keeps on every, every year, every decade, every generation, it's still there, but there is no verifiable proof that she ever uttered those words. The end of the year is the winter at Valley Forge. The army's at Valley Forge because it's near Philadelphia. The British are in Philadelphia for the winter. Um, winter quarters, winter encampments, two armies, very, very little fighting in the winter. Uh, they'd be near each other though, they keep an eye on each other. At Valley Forge, of course, the Marquis de Lafayette is there. He comes over from France, the richest, at the age of 20, considered one of the richest, if not the richest man in all of France. Old family money, married old family money, but he wanted to be more than just, than just a, a macaroni, a clothes horse. He wanted to do something and he learns about the American Revolution and he says, I have to be there. So he comes over, he kind of becomes the son Washington never had. They had a wonderful father-son relationship. By the way, Washington never had children of his own. Uh, that's another story. But another man who shows up is this man, Baron von Steuben. He comes up and he says to Washington, my specialty is training armies. That's what I was, tra I was trained in. That's what I did in Europe. I can do it with your army, let me show you. And Washington liked von Steuben and said, go ahead and show me. And that's what von Steuben does. He does two things. He instills discipline in the army. Discipline so that when an officer gives an order, the men will obey that order without hesitation. That's really important. Without debate, without, without yeah, well, maybe yes, maybe no. I mentioned earlier, Patrick Henry, the distinctions are no more. I'm not a Virginian, I'm, I'm not a, um, a New Jersey, I'm not a New Yorker, I'm an American. This was a concept again that I mentioned earlier that was vitally important if this war is going to be won, that 
the, the, the men fighting, their allegiance is to the country as a whole and to Washington, not to the individual uh, at this point in time states that they come from. Hugely important, thanks to von Steuben. So in 1778, we have the battle at Monmouth where uh, Washington's forces, but not under Washington original, uh, originally, confront the British in Monmouth and the British actually are winning. There's a whole story involved with that. But then here comes Washington and Washington rallies his troops. They've been trained by von Steuben. Washington gives an order, follow me, and they do. And they do. Von Steuben was really, really important. We have what's called the hard winter of 1779, 1780. This is the second winter encampment in Morristown by Washington and his army. It was so cold for so long, every saltwater inlet from North Carolina to Canada froze over completely. Think about this for a second. New York Harbor was totally frozen over. You could walk across it. People did. You could ride your horse across New York Harbor. So this weather is horrible. Six to eight foot snow drifts. Uh, winds were so strong, the snow was coming down sideways. The British say, hey, wait a minute. Washington, I mean, they knew where Washington was. Washington's in this house. His army is five miles away. Let's send some men over because we can now walk across New York Harbor and ride our horses across and we can do it quickly so we won't be seen. Let's kidnap Washington and then we can end the war. So they, they do a diversionary attack, but the group of men assigned to kidnap Washington, they cross New York Harbor, they walk and they ride their horses across. They get to New Jersey, they can't find Morristown. I'm thinking their iPhone batteries ran out of juice, but that's just me. They couldn't find Morristown, literally. I mean, there are no road signs. The, the, the weather was atrocious. They spent about 24 hours roaming around. And finally, they're starting to get frostbite for real. And they go back. So the weather kind of gave them a chance. And the weather took that chance away. Now, if you come to Morristown, Morristown Green, and I hope you all will, uh, you're going to see this statue. There's three men in here. I'm sure you recognize George Washington on your right. In the middle is Alexander Hamilton, and on the left is the Marquis de Lafayette. I spoke about him earlier. So the Marquis went to France to help to help persuade the king to support the revolution. Of course, you spoke about Saratoga. Marquis comes to Morristown in May of 1780, and this statue depicts the Marquis telling Washington, my king will sign an alliance with you. We will support the American Revolution. This is extraordinarily important because without France's help, we probably would have lost the war. The final two battles in New Jersey, Connecticut Farms and Springfield. By the way, Connecticut Farms is not the state of Connecticut. Union was called Connecticut Farms back then. If you know your geography, uh, Union and Springfield are right next to each other. The last two battles in New Jersey, the British were not successful in either case. So finally, 1781, we have Yorktown, the British views, General Corn Washington surrenders to uh, Washington, General Corn Wallace surrenders to Washington. Two years later, we have the Treaty of 1783. This is the unfinished painting by Benjamin West. So the idea here was the five American uh, treaty representatives and two British representatives would sign this treaty, it would, there'd be a painting uh, for posterity. Well, the two British representatives, they didn't, want, they didn't want their picture to go down in history. So they show up, they sign, they leave. <laughs> That's it, so the painting's unfinished. Meanwhile, if you look at the picture, of course, you can see Ben Franklin in the middle. To his left is John Adams. Well, John Adams thinks this is the funniest thing he's ever seen. So what does John Adams do? He buys this unfinished painting. He has a chip to New England and he has it hung over his fireplace. <laughs> oh, that's funny. George Washington slept here. What am I talking about? 
This is the Ford Mansion in Morristown. Uh, this is where I'm a docent. George Washington lived here for a little over six months during the Revolutionary War. Also living here was Martha Washington. And also living here was Alexander Hamilton. So while Hamilton is here, uh, he, was, he continues dating Elizabeth Schuyler. They do eventually get married. Uh, they then wrote a Broadway play and they made millions of dollars. So in the Ford Mansion are just a few things that I think are kind of fun. One of them is this musket. So this musket is composed of three separate pieces. You've got the barrel, which is of course the long wooden part that the musket ball goes through. You've got the stock, that's the wooden part that rests against your shoulder. And you've got the lock, the locking mechanism, the metal parts that actually fire the musket. musket. So it so happens that three, these three pieces are actually made in separate locations. So the pieces have to come to a central location. The musket has to be assembled and then it's handed to the soldier, lock, stock, and barrel. You ever heard of that phrase? Well, that's where it comes from. In the Ford Mansion are beds. So you say to yourself, yeah, well, so what? Well, bedding back then was a little bit different than it is today. First of all, there was no such thing as a standard size. All beds were made individually, but most people didn't have a bed. The average colonial home at this period of time, as I said average, was between roughly 750 square feet. The average family had between seven and 10 children, although not all survived, unfortunately. So where are you gonna put beds? Beds are permanent. So what most people did was they slept on mattresses. So you'd go outside, you get some hay, stuff it inside of a covering, voila, you have a mattress. So people would, uh, sleep on their mattresses, you know, stack them up in the day to get them out of the way. At night, they'd lay them out. They would then hit the mattresses with a stick. Why? To get the vermin out, which leads to an expression. You may have heard uh, when it's time to go to bed, it's time to hit the hay. Well, that's where it comes from. Ah, my favorite, the chamber pot. I love when I get kids on tours. Uh, because I always ask them, all right, kids, who can tell me what this is? And one little boy said, oh, that's easy. That's an oversized Starbucks coffee cup. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> Shows you the times we live. So my wife and I were in this colonial themed restaurant. And she says, I have to go to the bathroom. And I said, yeah, no problem. Go through that door and make a left turn. And she looks at me and she says, how do you know that? We've never been here before. Well, I knew it because of a sign that I saw when we entered the restaurant. So back in colonial times, chamber pots were used at night. During the day, you went outside to what was called the necessary. Now we'd call them outhouses, but back then they were called necessaries. So when we entered this restaurant, I saw a sign on the wall with an arrow and the sign said necessary. So that's how I knew where the restrooms were. So I took a picture. <laughs> so if you are in a colonial themed building or wherever and you see necessaries, you will now know what that means. So I am just about done here, but I'm going to leave you with my Revolutionary War riddle. Yes, riddle. So. Definition of terms. If you were a Whig, you were for separating from the king from the crown. If you were a Tory, you were for remaining loyal to the king to the crown. So here is the question. What was the Whig's favorite food? In in seven years and since I've been asking this question, I've had three people, three people actually give me the right answer. Okay, are you ready for the answer? What was the Whig's favorite food? How about chicken catch a Tory? Get it? Get it? So on behalf of myself and the real king, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Before I, before I get out of screen sharing and take any questions, et cetera, this is my card. 
My website is revolutionarywarlectures.com. If you go on my website, you will see I'm now, I'm now posting my 2022 schedule. And I'm also on my lectures that are on there so far, you'll see V for virtual, IP for in-person or H for hybrid. Uh, for virtual lectures, if you want to, if, if, what, if a topic lo looks interesting and it's, let's say, a library, uh, contact them, get a, um, a Zoom invite, and uh, you're in business. If you belong to a, another, to a club, an organization, a school, religious institution, whatever, any place that, that, that has lecturers come in, uh, uh, please keep me in mind or, and please pass my information over to whoever would be in charge of that. Okay, I am done. I'm going to get out of screen sharing and we'll see if we have any questions. So just bear with me a moment. Okay, I am here. All I'm right. There. All right. Thank you. I'll put this up as a placeholder and we can get started. If anybody does have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat in the Q&A feature. Um, we'll be happy to, to, to answer them. Um, first question, and please don't be afraid to ask if you feel like it's a dumb question or anything. There are no dumb questions here. Um, but somebody asked, which direction did Washington travel in crossing the Delaware? Well, when he, uh, when he was being chased by the British, he went from New Jersey into Pennsylvania. And then, so that would have been West. And then uh, when he comes back to New Jersey, which leads to as actually what's called Azenpink Creek, uh, and then in Trenton, uh, he'd be going from Pennsylvania back into New Jersey. So I hope that's clear. What happened to Sam Adams? Samuel Adams, uh, well, eventually, of course, he dies, as everyone does, but uh, he was not in the best of health. Uh, you know, originally he tried a number of businesses. His family, I, there, there's a connection between Samuel Adams and beer. His family were maltsters. They, they, they made malt for beer. Uh, uh, but he was just not, he went to Harvard, but he was just wasn't good at business, but he was really good uh, with um, in politics. But uh, uh, other, others kind of, kind of took over, especially when the war Took, took part. I think he became a governor of, of um, Massachusetts. So at any rate, I, that, that's all I can really tell you and uh, can look it up. By the Could way, I happened to collect, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, I happened to collect autographs and I happened to have Sam, a, Sam Adams autograph, their signature on a document. Uh, and I think it says, hang on a second. Yeah, I was going to see if it if it actually gave us title, but it doesn't. Okay, at any rate, moving on. <laughs> Could we have kept Benedict Arnold loyal somehow? Oh my God, uh, Benedict Arnold is is a, is a, uh, so involved. Yeah, there were instances, there were points in time where it all could have changed. Uh, one was he was up for promotion. And in the beginning of the war, let me just set this up a little bit. In the beginning of the Revolutionary War, Congress ran the war. They literally ran the war. They didn't trust an army because historically armies were known to take over governments and declare themselves in charge and Washington declare himself king and Congress would have, you know, no options. Uh, of course, that wasn't Washington's uh, plan, but nonetheless, Congress said no. So they ran the war and they had, they decided they didn't want the army to get too powerful. So any given state could only have two major generals. So Benedict Arnold is a brigadier general. He's got all these successes, but because he was from Connecticut, because Connecticut already had two brigadier generals, uh, I'm sorry, major generals, uh, he was not promoted. Well, he really got upset and Washington agreed with him. So Washington worked and finally Benedict Arnold gets promoted, except in the military, when you get your promotion it's called time in grade and someone who's promoted ahead of you to the same rank actually outranks you. So once again, he's outranked by his contemporaries. And so that got him very upset. Then 
I mean, if, if that wouldn't have happened, uh, uh, maybe Arnold would, would, would have had different, different thoughts about, about things. Then there was, he becomes commandant of Philadelphia and he meets Peggy Shippen and eventually marries her. And she was basically from a loyalist family. Um, she was quite complicit in this becoming a traitor. But he eventually, uh, be, uh, he goes in front of a, of a court martial for let's say misappropriating government funds. He's found guilty of two minor charges and Washington has to reprimand him. And again, Arnold is furious because he doesn't think he did anything wrong. And so then there's the influence of Peggy Ship and his wife and, and, and so on and so forth. So if any of those two things, and there were other things by the way too, in fact, his victory, he really being the one who brought the victory at Saratoga, but he didn't get the credit. General Gates, who was the commanding general, took all the credit. So all of these things, if any one of them might've been different, maybe Arnold uh, wouldn't, would, would have been, the, the outcome would have been different also. I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> In today's political climate, is the revolutionary slash patriotic spirit still alive or has it changed? You know, I, um, I'm gonna just, I'll answer that very just briefly, but I don't wanna get into a debate over, over things. In my own opinion, uh, the, the revolutionary spirit to use that term is, 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 um, is just not here anymore. Uh, but I, I'm going to leave it go with that. Okay. Next question. <laughs> In your studies, what is the most surprising fact you've learned? Oh my God. The most surprising fact I've learned. Well, I think the, to me, the most, int well, what I think is the one that I, I mentioned Thomas Paine briefly, Thomas Paine, they, they should make a movie about Thomas Paine's life. This man was so extraordinary. And we, we don't remember him at all today. I mean, really, you know, there's a statue of Thomas Paine in Morristown. There's a little park in Morristown, right near the Morristown Green, for those of you who are familiar with Morristown, called Burnham Park. And there's a statue of Thomas Paine there. Of all, uh, uh, Thomas Paine's life, especially during the French Revolution, he's in jail, he's supposed to be guillotined, but by just a quirk of fate, he's, he's not guillotined. And just all the things he did, uh, and the, the story of his life, to me, is just unbelievably fascinating. And then you've got all of the myths and legends and things that, you know, we, we, uh, we kind of grew up believing, like, the George, like George Washington had false teeth, which he did. What were they made out of? Most people say wood. They were never wood. Not even once. Never, ever, ever. So, and, and so when, I, when I come across these, uh, to me, they're, 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 they're kind of fun. And they don't do, in my opinion, um, anybody any harm. Uh, and so I, and you know, what was Napoleon short? He was not short. He was average height. And there's a whole reason why he, people thought he was short. So these I find funny, but, uh, uh, but the, the life of Thomas Paine to me is unbelievably extraordinary. And if you wanna read about someone who stood by his ideals? Maybe this is this is this is a way to, to put it. He, he 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 stuck to his ideals. He stuck to what he believed in. And as, as we would say today, let the chips fall where they may. So there you go. Would you agree with Leonard London's title of his work, "Cockpit of the Revolution," essentially as New Jersey was the the center point of the revolution? Absolutely. Oh, sure. Sure. Washington has spent more time in New Jersey than any other state. Uh, we had the battles here. Uh, we had Walt Washington spent two, two winter encampments um, in New Jersey. Um, yeah, well, New Jersey, again, plus New Jersey, if, if you look geographically, we're in between New York we're in, and Philadelphia. And even if you want to go up to Boston, but the, the focus of things kind of shifts south. Uh, back in, in, into New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And we're right in, right in the center of that. So yeah, yeah, the, 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 the war really is, a lot of it's centered here in New Jersey. Uh, somebody said, I live on a revolutionary campground and people who grew up here say the revolutionary spirit is in the land. 
Okay. All right. No, listen, that, that's fine. I hope it's in my lectures, uh, <laughs> but I don't, I don't talk politics. So. Can you spend more on what I can't read the rest of this? Yeah. Could you expand more on what von Steuben did in discipline in the Continental Army? Yeah. So Baron von Steuben, he was, uh, he was, he was from one of the, one of the German states. Germany was not a country yet. There were these individual states. And he was trained at the, the uh, a military academy. The, the, and he was, a, he was a successful officer. But there were no wars going on when the American Revolution took place. So Congress sent over some men, one was Silas Dean, to recruit uh, European officers to come join our army. So that's how um, Baron von Steuben eventually comes over. So he goes to Washington and he says, look, uh, your army's never been trained and that's what I do. Now, he spoke very little English. He did speak French and there were some in, in the army who also spoke French. So what happened was von Steuben with the interpreter would train 10 men and then those 10 would train each would train 10 more. And then those 10, each would train 10 more and so on and so forth. So he came up with this way of training everybody. And he trained them in, in the, the way that he was trained uh, in uh, maneuvers, uh, really how to use their weapons properly. Also camp cleanliness and hygiene, big factor. Diseases were rampant during the Revolutionary War, especially smallpox. But typhus, if your water is contaminated, if your sewage, so to speak, is, say, uphill, and so it gravitates downhill to, to, to your drinking water, you're going to get typhus. These are horrible diseases. And so he taught the army about cleanliness and hygiene. And he taught the army to act as one unit, not from 13 individual states. And this was really, really key. When the war was over, by the way, he was given a property in Hackensack, and you can go there. It's called the Von Steuben House, uh, and it's right near the Riverside Square Mall. So we're right behind the mall. So I hope that helps. Uh, apparently, there's a statue of Thomas Paine in Bordentown. Correct. There is. He lived there a short time. There are three statues of Thomas Paine in the United States. I forget where the third one is. Uh, and there's at least one in England where he was born. Uh, but, you know, the one in Morristown, and I mentioned earlier in Burnham Park, a lot of people don't even know Burnham Park exists. It's like, it's like on, the, uh, on the commuter road to, to Mendham and Morristown. And a lot of people see it, but they don't see it. Uh, and it's, the statue is of him writing, these are the times that try men's souls. So... I am fascinated by the knife and tomahawk fighting that happened in the French and Indian War. Was there any of that kind of fighting between the Americans and the British? Or was that more of an American Indian way of fighting? Did the Indians teach the Americans or the British this way of fighting? To my knowledge, and I'm not an expert on this, but to my knowledge, the, the Indian way of fighting by the, was really more in the French and Indian War uh, during the Revolutionary War, when you had the two armies, and yes, there was still some fighting like that, but uh, not a whole lot. But ironically, it comes back uh, in the beginning of the War of 1812, when ex we expand from, say, the Appalachians west to the Mississippi, and the Native Americans are being pushed west, and the, and the British, who are still up in Canada, are encouraging the Native Americans to fight. So uh, some of that, that type of fighting came back in the West, uh, the West me, me, meaning West of the Appalachians. Uh, uh, but I, in my, my understanding is that for the most part during the major battles of the Revolutionary War, uh, that was not uh, what was happening. Some people say that the only reason the Americans won the war was because of the French. What do you think about that? Oh, well, I agree in that without the French, we lost the war. 
We just didn't have enough of anything. Britain could have outlasted us. Sure, Britain has to go 3,000 miles to get to Canada, really, which was kind of like a, their, their big staging area. <coughs> Excuse me. But it was it, we were eventually going to run out of everything. It was as simple as that. Uh, but eventually, and so I agree with that with that statement. We'd have lost the war without without France's help. Well, I don't see any more questions anywhere, so I think we can go ahead and, and end it there. Cindy, would you like to take us out? I will take us out. Thank you, everyone. I do hope you continue to have a good holiday season. Joel, thank you so much. There's a lot of information here, I have to say. I'll probably go back and watch it on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so I, I took it in, but I watched it. Um, I, uh, I am a kind of lover of puns in that, so I love the chicken cacciatore there at the end, and uh, uh, we'll probably use it in some conversation and hurt somebody's head with it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> if I get a little corny laugh, it's, it works. Um, we did get a lot I saw in there that, that people said that it was very enjoyable. Uh, one lady said she might contact you for her DAR group. So um, thank you very much my, for helping my us. My pleasure. Out. Thank you, and I hope to see you all again. All right. Very good. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.